The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome into episode five of season three of the Drum Candy Podcast. And this is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week, I brought Tom Went and David Throckmorton back to the studio. And we also have our special guest, Paul Wells, to do 10 Reasons to Love the Great Dave Weckle. If you're new to Dave Weckle, then there should be a lot of new music for you to dig back through in discography and check out. I mean, it's absolutely incredible musicianship, incredible playing, revolutionary drumming, really. And if you're a longtime Dave Weckle listener and fan like I am, there'll probably be some stuff you haven't listened to in a while or maybe you've never heard of before. Um, so yeah, this is a real treat. So special thanks to Tom and Dave and Paul. And let's get to 10 Reasons to Love, Dave Weckle. Okay, this is going to be interesting because I know Dave Weckle is your guy, and it sounds like he's your guy, and he's not really Tom and I's guy, but maybe more guy than Tom's guy. So it's going but to like, be as interesting. A, <laughs> as, a, as a kid, like, I, you know, I was the right age. I caught, he was the hot guy. I caught the bug. I was already in the gad. I heard Weckle. He kind of sounded like an extension of gad, so mm -hmm. it made perfect sense for me, you know? And uh, so, yeah, like, Middle school through my early twenties, like he was, he was my guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not afraid to admit it. He's my man. <laughs> Nothing wrong with He's that. nasty. Mm -mm. Nothing wrong with that. He is nasty. Yeah. That's for sure. He's got some stuff. So I was, I was deep into Neil. Middle school, Neil, Bill Bruford, you know, maybe some Phil Collins, some some uh, some Carl Palmer here and there, and um, and actually a fair amount of Billy Cobham, some Buddy Rich. But my drum teacher, um, around seventh or eighth grade, studying with Jan Fung at Rogers Middle School, and he came in one day with a cassette tape, and he put it on. And I don't know if he played. Was I know the first Ledger Band record. Yeah, the first yeah. Electric Band record, and he played me. I know he played me Rumble, and he played me Got a Match. Mm -hmm. That's the first I don't two know tunes which, I heard. Which too. order? Yep. And I mean, they, the Rumble was cool, but Got a Match was. I'd never heard anything. Yeah, like that. my brother yeah. played me Rumble. He was home from the military on break. He just saw the band live with Scott Henderson. He played me Rumble, and I was like, I didn't really kind of understand. There's like sequences and stuff. Yeah. I was like, man, what's the stuff where he's just playing the drums? And he played me Got a Match. And then my response was, you sure this isn't two guys? <laughs> <laughs> I was really young. Yeah. He's like, no, it's one guy. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, he sounds like Gad, just like amped up, you know? Yeah. And um, and you asked him the Gad the one, the 10 Reasons I Love Steve Gadd, think about how we met. When Paul and I first met, was me, it was my first gig at the balcony. Who were you playing with? I was playing with Tom Meston, Sean Purcell, and John Hall. Wow. Playing kind of fusion yeah. music, which I'm sure I didn't play well. Um, no, you played your ass off. You sounded like, you were like 90% to Weckle. Low level. Like you were playing your <laughs> No, ass I was off. not. <laughs> I mean, I've been playing, I was playing I was, good for a 17 year old kid for sure. Yeah, yeah, but I like, was blown away. But um, that's how we met, was like he got to hear me pretending to try to sound like. <laughs> Did you have the setup? Did, were you trying yeah. to do the. Kind and, of, I was trying to do that. Yeah, you had, you had the sticks. <laughs> you of had course, the sticks. Yeah. You had, you know, yeah. it's, I, I went, I, I don't know if I heard you or I took a look at the kit, but immediately. Well, you had heard about, I think Sean Purcell told you. About me, I thought you said. Like, there's this guy, I don't know. this young guy. That I went. was going to the balcony all the time. Oh, maybe like, that's I what it was. I would just go then. there every okay. night. I used to walk from my dad's house yeah. to the balcony, which wow. is a good. That's a long walk. It's a long walk, and there's a serious, there's a serious uphill. I, I've, I've <laughs> made that walk with you a couple times, yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah. And I have fond memories of walking. I'd be like, are we, are we almost there, man? And I'd have my, <laughs> <laughs> I'd have my Walkman, and I'd be listening to some GRP record or something. Yeah. Makes sense. And I would walk, and, and, and I don't know if anybody told me about you, but I just, there was a band playing, and I was like, this is a fusion band. Band, and this guy is deep, deep into Weckle. <laughs> and, I like, and I remember being like, I, I remember at first being like skeptical, like, I don't, I haven't heard of this guy. There's no way. And then, a kid and very too. quickly, I was like, yeah, this guy is, this guy can play. Wow. This guy can play, and and he's studied this stuff. And I, I asked you on a set break. I remember you were at the kit still, like after the set. I went up, and I was like. You like Dave Weckle, don't you? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And you're like, yeah. What, what made and, you realize and, that? And 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 then I and then I think we just were like, we okay, became we're friends like buddies. Now. Yeah, we're friends now. Yeah, we would spend like weekends on the phone talking, going we through modern spend, drummer together. Did we still spend 
Yeah, you're right. Uh, it's, yeah. A yeah. ridiculous amount of time on the phone. Yeah, we're doing the same thing now, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so who's your shared new Weckle? Do you have a new guy that you're both like, have you been checking out? Elvin? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. the new guy is Elvin, yeah. <laughs> but we talk about Weckle. We talk about Gad <clears throat> still, Peter Erskine. We talk about these guys a lot still. But it's usually, yeah, we're talking about Tony... Motion. Everything, man. Yeah. We talk about everything. We yeah. talk even talk about guys that we same with Tom and I. Like sometimes someone else is really into somebody and you'll you'll yep. oh but play me some stuff. Mm -hmm. Let me what should I check out of this guy? I mean yep. that's how it that should be, you know? Yeah. That's what this show is all about. For yeah. right. Half of these records I'm like, I didn't know this existed. Yeah. Like what is this? So let's mm -hmm. start with the Bill Connors. Yeah. Why'd you yeah. pick Titan and not what Dave said you should well, Step picked. It is the is, is a more famous track, and I think this is... I, I know Zach Danziger talks about this track. Um, he's this one really tight. into Weckl in this period and Weckl on this album, and he talks about Step It, the tune, the title track, Step It, and mm -hmm. Weckl. There's a vamp, and Weckl plays a solo that's really remarkable, and it really kind of helped put him on the map. I like this tune because it's more mellow. It's kind of it, it goes back and forth between six eight and five eight, I think. And um Weckl plays a solo over this mellow sort of vamp in six eight. And it's just cool to hear him play his language at the time um in six eight. There's a lot of space in this solo. The sound of the drums is really remarkable, and I feel like there are points where he's playing the sound of the drums more than he's playing licks. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I just I just dig this one. This is oh, how old was he on this? About twenty four. He oh, so wow. he was born in nineteen sixty, January nineteen sixty. Okay. So it's easy to kind of pin a yeah, yeah. an age to the. You don't have to do any math, yeah. which I'm. You know, I'm not good at. I'm it very yeah. bad. At. Yeah. Is so yeah, a, is he an Aquarius or a Capricorn? That I don't know. We know what the date of is. Oh, no. January what? I, it's, I think it's January. It's January, but yeah. I don't remember mm. the date. Because I'm a January. That's why I remember. I mean, I'm Aquarius, by the way. For those of you out there that want to so know. So why? Yeah. Oh. What's your birthday? 26th. Oh, January? Yeah. Mine's 25th. Oh. That's crazy. Oh, Shoot. You guys. And I'm doing a hang for my birthday on your birthday on the 26th. Shoot. I'll bring oh, yeah. presents for myself. Yeah, yeah come out. We'll, we'll exchange <laughs> gifts. <laughs> I'll Dave give you, we'll steal those sticks from Wells and give them to each other. <laughs> Dave yeah. is January 8th. So he's a Capricorn. Okay. Yeah. Get yeah. out of here. <laughs> Get out of here. Let's check out Bill Connors. <laughs> And just that, mm -hmm. and the two hi hats thing. I don't know this record at all. This is exciting. What's the second chunk here? Uh, it's, it's the three, drum solo. Three twenty. Yeah. And I also like you can hear his mannerisms, the way he flicks his head and stuff. You can hear <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can hear that. <laughs> just think about it. <laughs> Thank you. 
so much gad in that. So, tons. Yeah, it's almost like three quartets. Yeah, very. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, tons man. Again. It really, it you 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 put it perfectly. It's sort of like an extension of him. Completely. That's exactly. Yeah. That's that's Wild. a great great way to put it. Yeah. So I mean, he was young here, so obviously yeah. he was still finding his thing. But he sounds like Weckle, though. He sounds like Weckle, Weckle yep. and, and you're right. It's it's killing. I, <laughs> I do think, and this is you know can debate. I feel like somehow the the the, the step it solo, the title track solo, it's it seems almost more like um, to my ears like <clears throat> I don't even know, like just really like I don't even know what I'm trying to say, like. I don't want to say advanced, but it's like it's almost more mysterious. Like the way the phrasing, this sounds a little more like, like I've heard I, I have heard it a bunch because I listen to all this stuff a lot. But it, like I can hear like more Gad mm -hmm. in that than like what I hear in like Step It. Mm -hmm. Step It sounds like it was more like I don't know, elevated or mysterious. It's mm -hmm. Like wow, where's he getting these yeah, ideas from? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I think I remember reading in in, in a modern German interview interview talking about that tune that he they this tune up, when we just no no about, about step, step it, it that they actually did that to a click oh um because wow. the guys were having a hard time playing the vamp behind the stuff he was doing because yeah. he was playing stuff that's really complicated and he's and he's doing a lot of beat dis displacements yeah, displacement sure. on that you on know that what, solo. I, 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 I actually have a really funny Steve Gaz story that uh, <clears throat> trombonist Jay Ashby told me in the early 90s, Jay was in uh, Tanya Maria's band, the Brazilian singer, who, whose music could be pretty complex. And they were doing a recording, <clears throat> and Gad was on the record. And there was an introduction to a tune that was really rhythmically complex that she was playing. And the, the rest of the band was having a really hard time coming in at the right spot. So she said, okay, put the click on. We'll just do it to a click, no problem. The click was broken. So Gad in the drum booth said, uh, just, you know, give him my track. I'll, I'll give him a click on the cowbell. And he said that Gad sat there smoking a cigarette, playing a cowbell, just quarter notes. And he said it was just, it was like a click. <laughs> no yeah, reference. Of course it was. Yeah. I, I, he told me just, that story, too. Just smoking and, a cigarette. And, and the just... way he visually, like, you know, it, there was, like, this kind of, like. Yeah, exactly. He's just smoking and just playing it. Yeah. But it was like the like more yeah. perfect than the yeah. click could have ever been. Right. <laughs> Put the click out of business with that. Right. <laughs> Tell you. All right. Well, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Nineteen eighty-six. So that was that previous one you said eighty-four. Eighty-four. But it might have came out in eighty-five. I don't know. It, it, according to whatever the oh, okay. official release. Oh, okay. I think it was recorded in eighty-four, but okay. I could be wrong. The, interestingly. Uh, Dave was playing with um, this trio, Bill Connors and Tom Kennedy, at the bottom line when Chick Corea first heard him play. Oh, wow. Chick was in person. looking in person. Chick yeah. was looking for a drummer for uh, the Electric Band, what became the Electric Band, and um, people had been recommending Weckl to Chick. Um, Michael Brecker had recommended Weckl to him. It's like, oh, you got to check out this guy Weckl. He had been over actually at Tanya Maria's house. And she was like, oh, listen to this record. It's this great pianist, Michelle Camilo, put out this record and check this out. And Weckl happened to be on that record. And Chick was like, oh, who is this Weckl guy? And then he happened to be looking at the Village Voice. And he saw, like, he was in New York. And he was like, oh, look, he's playing at the bottom line with my old uh, guitarist, Bill Connors. Let's go see him. And, and so Weckl was playing oh, wow. with that same trio. And he said that uh, on that gig... He was playing a solo and his he had like a the floor tom thing. Yeah, the, yeah, his floor tom was on a stand with his ride cymbal and also like another crash or something. And mid gig, the whole stand f fell over. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Like, of course, the gig that chick is on, <laughs> or the gig chick comes to. That's funny. But he still got the gig. Maybe maybe if the floor tom wouldn't have fallen over, he wouldn't never know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Well, the next one you picked is this is Wells too. Yeah, yeah from right. uh, Tomba and Seven Four. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so was Michelle this Michelle Camillo? Yeah, Michelle yeah. Camillo. This might have been no. This wasn't the record that Chick would have heard. Chick would have heard, I think, the record "Why Not." Oh Isn't yeah. That, that these are both kind of early though. Yeah, but this is this is eighty six. I think yeah. this is. I think he'd been playing with Chick yeah, by yeah. this point, but uh -huh. he was still living in New York. Um, I, I'm kind of. It just as a fan, I guess, it, but also as a drummer who lives in New York, I'm I'm a bit fascinated by the idea of Weckl in New York because he live he's lived in Los Angeles. Now he's 
he's he's back home in St. Louis, um, but uh, where he grew up. But but he did have this period where he lived in New York and he was sort of freelancing around New York. He was playing sessions. He was at an early stage playing in a club date band. And I just kind of imagine him like going, you know, hearing people play that he loved, like hearing Gad and people mm. like that. And, and um, you know, like showing up at the power station to do a jingle or whatever, you know, just that kind of thing mm. that, you know, it's kind of, I, you know, just kind of interested in that period of his career for some reason. Why'd you pick this segment? So this is two, two minutes and 40 seconds in. Well, I just, I picked the head just if you want to hear the head of the tune because it's. Just so you get a vibe of the tune. But then they they um they trade. Where well, they don't really trade, but there's sort of these hits that Weckl plays around. It's just really great soloing. And this was a really this was a cool trio or a cool rhythm section of, of Michelle Camilo on piano, Anthony Jackson on bass, and Weckl. Oh, and they yeah. had a very sort of like They had a thing. They had a thing for sure. So and should, and um, should we jump to You know, the... you could probably jump to the solo, I think, since we don't have that much time. All right. Seven fifty So the whole <clears> tune's <throat> in seven, or most of it's in seven. Here we go. This part's in four. Like Gad, he has his things. They're just more complicated. Yeah. It's like he's always going to do the splashy thing. Mm -hmm. He's always going to do the diddles on the ride and the hi hat. Mm -hmm. It's unmistakable to me that that's Weckl. There's no Six, way. Sixteenth things between the lower toms and a double on the bass drum. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that sort of language. Um, but it's funny though. Like to to me, it's so like nostalgic here and all this stuff because mm -hmm. it's like bringing me back to being a kid, like when I met you and stuff and. I don't listen to this stuff very often anymore. It, it's just, it's still fun to hear it. It's amazing. But like, his playing really changed a couple of years later, you know? Like, totally. it, it, you know, quickly. Like, some guys just sound the way they sound. They just always sound that way. And there's a, like, it still sounds like Dave Weckl, but his playing got really different, you know, four years later. Yeah. Or so. What are you hearing like, in this that is not in later? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, a lot of it's sound, the sound of his playing, like the sound of his drums and cymbals. And, um, you know, this still kind of reminds me of the stuff on the on Step It. Like, it's still kind of mm -hmm. coming out of the same yeah. place, you know? You know, very, very Gad influenced still, you know? But I mean, he not that he's, he's not a clone at all. He has yeah. his own vocabulary it, his own way of playing and you know go ahead. I, I hear a lot of Erskine in this era mm -hmm. um, as far as influence too because of um, certain things with the phrasing and the space that I hear is being influenced by Erskine but I also and, and this is relevant to the tune am, Amnesia that we, we both picked mm -hmm. for this um, he 
one of the things that he got, he he's always talked about Buddy Rich being a really big influence. Sure, yeah. One of the things that, that Buddy, one of my favorite things that Buddy does is the way that Buddy sets up figures or sets up a band's entrance in kind of a slightly backwards and very slick way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like a classic Buddy thing, and you hear this on the tune Time Check, would be if the band has an entrance on beat two. You know, like it's a one, two, three, four, one, band kind of thing. He would set that up by playing a big accent on beat four, leave beat one empty. Oh, yeah. So, bow, bow, like that. And it's like, it's a really slick thing. Buddy might have gotten it from Shadow Wilson or somebody like that. You know, it's a swing era kind of a thing to do. But Weckl does that. I hear him do that a lot. And especially in this era, set, and you hear it on some of these solos where he'll stop a little bit before you expect him, leave some space, and then have yeah. the band. Yeah, he's also in. a great space guy that like we yep. talked yeah. about. Again, yeah. he plays a lot of notes, obviously, but 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 he's really like that first solo. No, he knows how to do it. There's tons of space in that, yep. you yeah. know. Yeah. And like you said, he's almost playing more with the sound mm-hmm. than like just let me play a bunch of stuff, you know. And I think that's what people maybe didn't. It sometimes the people that tried to totally. tried to imitate they, they didn't or understand people that the f- criticized him yeah they didn't understand the phrasing and mm-hmm. and and the space and the, the nuance and the you know the pushing and pulling thing he, absolutely he's just got so much so much vocabulary and so much yeah. so many things to say you know for sure yeah. we all I always say this everybody has their licks and stuff and he does too but it's not just that it's not it's not, like he's he's he has a lot to say mm-hmm. as an improviser you know. <clears throat> I called him not just past PASIC, but the previous PASIC he played at. He played a solo that was just so sophisticated. I was like, this guy's language is on another level. Mm-hmm. Like, I couldn't follow him, but I was enthralled the whole time. Like, mm-hmm. he yeah. was just, he was speaking. <laughs> Whatever he was doing, I was like, what? Yeah. That is, that's a language. You know, I wanted to bring this up, and maybe this is the right time to bring it up, but since you mentioned PASIC and the educational thing, he is an outstanding educator. And, um, uh, I wanted to point out that I took a lesson from him uh, about eight years ago, um, and it was brought on because I was having some back issues. I was having some sort of upper back issues, and I suspected that it could have been a posture or a setup thing, and I knew that he was the guy to talk to because he's really into this. He's, he talks about it at clinics or on videos about the ergonomics, and the setup of the kit, and all this kind of thing. So I, I took a lesson from him when he was in New York back in maybe 2014 and it completely changed it was an amazing lesson an amazing experience and and the way that i set up is still to this day comes from his hmm. guidance he, he looked at a video of me playing I, I had a video of me with uh curtis steigers at a jazz festival from like shortly previous to that lesson and he took one look at it. He's like, oh, yeah, you're doing this and this and this, and that's why you're having back problems. Now you need to do this and this and this differently. Mm. And showed me, you know, his... But, Weckl's a guy that's like a big sloucher, too. So I'm sure he's he's dealing with his own stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I can't I mean, speak he... for him, obviously, at, anyway. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. he's, he's very kind of, like, hunched over a little bit. Well, you know? he talked about it. He talked to mm-hmm. me about the, the stuff that he's had to deal with mm-hmm. and, sure. and the stuff that he's still working on. But, but, but I'm sure this... someone could see a video... Wacko and be like, hey, oh, he was a you major sh- you slouch. Shouldn't yeah. slouch or whatever. He had a lot you know? of Buddy Rich kind of vibe. Yeah, but, yeah, but he also had a lot of tilt when he was playing. Yeah, back in the traditional day. grip, mm-hmm. with, playing backbeats with the snare like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and now that's been changed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but but his my experience with that lesson really helped me a lot. Sure, and, and it really helped eliminate the the problems I was having. Mm-hmm. And he's you know really in tune with like okay how far away your bass drum is from you has a lot to do with how your upper back could feel and things like that. Wow. Were, I mean, he really put a lot of thought into this stuff and really mm. knows how to explain it. And, um, That's yeah, great. It was, a really, it was a great experience. Well, you mentioned amnesia. We'll do that next because chronologically we've got to do Gotta Match. This is, um, I think, I thought Night Sprite is Gad's kind of peak. I kind of think this is Weckl's, like, I've arrived. You can't question my greatness on this. He definitely arrived <laughs> on <Yeah>. this track. <laughs> um, I don't know why I always kind of gravitate towards these types of fusion tracks. These types amazing. meaning what? Like, the ones where they're just playing versus, like, super 
arranged and well, night sprites pretty arranged too. Yeah, but they're jamming though when they yeah. get going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where oh did yeah. I... That's ridiculous. So we're gonna go. Where did I say? The solo. The solo. The, these these trades still baffle yeah. me. Yeah. They still. I mean, they're they're really out of left field in a lot of ways. This is, again, we talk about phrasing. It's it's really it's really quite amazing. And and to listen to this, I actually have this on the amazing slow downer app and listening to this at like half speed <laughs> is not i mean it's still like wow <laughs> it's still really pretty advanced here we go hold on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's slick. It's it's, it's where does so, this come yeah, from? Where does it come from? I where agree. does this come from? What does this sound like to you, as as somebody who didn't grow up hearing these solos? You know, yeah. I mean, we've listened to this how many yeah. thousands of times? Have you heard yeah, too that, many that stuff? Like, I mean, what does it he- sound like to you? I, from a phrasing standpoint, the only thing that it sounds kind of similar to me is is actually like early Tony, like hmm. Seven Steps to Heaven. That yeah, that mid '60s era because his phrasing could be very, you know, I mean he he was very advanced for being <laughs> especially that young. And yeah. I hear it's a totally different style, but his you're right, his phrases are very interesting where, where he's starting and ending, and it yeah. kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Again, I think it's it's that Gad extension. Mm-hmm. It's like I hear it's like he took what Steve Gad did and said okay i'm gonna take this and now this is what i'm gonna do with it yeah very similar to like what max did with kluke yeah in in those guys you know he said okay i'm gonna take that and then i'm gonna add this it's weird like it's as big as a fan as i was growing up i'm still a fan and i love his playing all the different chances to hear him talk about his playing all the different instructional materials he's had over the years now and online there's just so much yep I never really hear him talk about that. Yeah, it's all basics. And, and I always want to hear him, which is what it should be when yeah. you're teaching is sure. you got to learn to do the important <laughs> stuff. And he's great at, at, at getting that to sink into people's brains. <laughs> but it, there's such a change. Like It's almost like um, he, you know, it's almost like some crazy space shit or something. Like, how, how do you... Like, what happened that made you play that way? I don't know where it's coming from, mm-hmm. you know? Well, in thinking about... <clears throat> Stepin well, has some of that, too. It's like, man, what, where is this coming from? Yeah. Like, you have this new way of playing that hasn't been tapped into at all. And he's 26. That's what I mean. Yeah, that, yeah. But well, <laughs> even freakier with the Tonys than we talked about being right, so yeah. young. <clears throat> it's, it, sounds like, it sounds like he's just advancing where he was. You know what I mean? It doesn't sound like he made some kind of crazy left turn as a player. It sounds like all of a sudden he just kind of like shifted into a higher gear, yeah. and he's and just. I'm sure some of that know. was chick, you know, God. just oh, man. Yeah. like just no pushing question. him and like. You know, I think he probably we were talking. A lot from that. We were talking. I think I said to you recently. I said to Paul Thompson. I, I saw some video that I had never seen of the Electric Band on the Light Years tour recently, playing some tunes I never heard them play before. Paul had seen it longer, but. Before me, which is shocking that I didn't see all these because I was the guy that was so into the band. I just, I've always been more of an audio guy than a video guy. But I saw this footage and hearing it now, I was like, man, they all sound so great. But wow, man, 
chick is so strong yeah. compared to these guys. Yeah. And it's not that's not a knock. No, he's, no. he's older and he was his band. Well, I mean, you know, I've, I've I've heard Dave say that you know, I mean, Ch- I mean, when Chick died, I mean, he was like, man, it, this guy is one of the most important people in my life. Of course, you know, and I think I think a lot of the phrasing you could, he was pro- that was probably brought on by playing with. That's Chick, what I feel. You know, it's like the, the yeah. way he was pushing well, they, those guys. They you know? toured for a year mm-hmm. before they recorded this album, mm-hmm. and you yeah. can hear that. I mean, they're so comfortable playing that stuff. That rapport is there. That's why it's it's so cool to hear mm-hmm. recordings of bands like that. Yeah. And not just guys that got to the studio for that day. Those can be cool too, but this is a different thing. And these, the other thing, sorry, go these ahead. guys toured so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They toured. Yeah. They were like All road the warriors yeah. on a level. I mean, yeah. even in the '80s when everybody was touring, it was possible to tour more than it is now. Mm-hmm. There were more venues, bigger budgets, etc. They were touring more than anybody, even in those days. Is that right? Tons and tons wow. and tons yeah, they of were out. And when they weren't doing the electric band, I'm talking through the whole stretch of the electric band, when they weren't doing the electric band, they were touring as the acoustic band. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, just the so amount the rapport, of work. Yeah. You know, the amount of work that um, that they did. I think the I think playing, Chick had a, he had a lot of, to do with that. Man. I, yeah. I think so, too. Well, I think that's, that's probably the closest yeah. thing I can think of of where it's coming from. It's like Chick's yeah. just... Yeah. Yeah. Um, Influence musically on those guys, but what he's doing, it's, it's it's like a natural extension of what he was doing a couple mm-hmm. years earlier, and from what what Gad brought to it, it just sounds like this this beautiful <clears throat> unfolding of that way. And, of and, and another thing cool is, I've heard a bunch of guys that play with Chick say this: like Chick didn't like to do a lot of takes. Yeah, mm-hmm. so they were very fast in the studio. Yeah, so. Uh, and I've heard interviews after with the electric band after Chick passed. Those guys saying like, "Well, we used to beg him to fix this and that," and he'd be like, "Well, should have played, should have played that," right. you know. <laughs> and it's just crazy to hear that. But that's what always ama- amazes me too is like how fast they were able to. I mean, sure they had been playing this stuff already, but on the albums to come, I've heard stories like Chick's bringing in charts the day of the session. Wow. And they yeah. record it, and that's that, That's what it was. And yeah. it's like, man, how do you get to that yeah. so fast? But I think that rapport of playing together in general is there even if you're reading a new tune. Mm-hmm. It's like you know each other's right. playing so that's well. Right. Sure. Well, I that's think right. you, it, the music can sort of come together quicker in that regard. But it's still amazing that that could Yeah, yeah. And, like and these that. guys in that band were all A-list yes. readers yes. on a level of like like the best L.A. or New York yeah. studio musician yeah. level yep. readers where they could sight read anything. I know, and, I know. And and so the, the actual reading wasn't an, an obstacle for yes. them. Yes, that's and a great they point. The they music, could get to the music even while they're reading or even while they're not that familiar with something. I think the combination of those two things is probably really what we're hearing a lot of, you yeah. know, you which think, is really amazing. something. Do you think they used a click on that? No way. No? Not on that, no. I, I, I think that would have been really tough to do that. Not to on that click. tune, yeah, I doubt it. I mean, that we, you hear them play that tune live, it sounds just as together as, as it does on the recording. They used a click on, there are certain tunes you could tell have sequences, mm-hmm. especially on the Light Years record or, or drum machine, you know, percussion parts, and that would have been to a click, mm. but, but not something like that, no. Mm. Well, the next one was the first thing I ever heard Dave Weckl do. It was a Modern Drummer sound supplement. So when I subscribed, they sent a cassette and it had not all of them, but the ones that they could get the rights to. Wow. And this was on there. Yeah, well, was, this was originally a floppy record in right? the 1987 wow. issue, I think. Yeah, this had been 91 they compiled it. So it had like Andy Newmark, Peter Erskine, Neil Peart, Phil Collins, and Chester Thompson. I all of those. Oh, I, yeah, I remember. I, uh, I had Rod Morgenstein. Um, Jonathan Mover, right? Jonathan Mover God, sounded I haven't amazing. I thought about those in forever. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, I still man. have a lot of those. I have Do a folder really? in my record collection <laughs> with all the modern drummers. That's sure they sound, the sound great. supplement. That's incredible. But yeah. what, what I loved about this one was he, there were some transcriptions of his playing and some analysis, and then he gave you the play-along track. So it was like, oh, here's the wow. chart. Now, good luck trying to play Have this. Have fun, yeah. This was the most complicated music I'd ever heard in my life, the most complicated drumming I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it kind of set the bar like, oh, someday I might be able to play to this yeah, track. Yeah. You know, this comes from his educational book and CD or tape originally, Contemporary Drummer Plus One. Mm. This the is I- in that? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, this is in that. And the idea was that there were these sort of music minus drums records back in the 60s and he wanted to do one that was 
up contemporary, to date. yeah, like like what a, what a studio drummer, a working drummer might encounter in the eighties, and Some that's crazy like a lot of fusion session. stuff. <laughs> yes. a, yeah, I know, absolutely I know. modulation. But, but <laughs> it, it, we were actually talking about this, and this I, I apologize. This is like a ridiculous name drop situation, and I apologize up front. But I was at at PASIC this year, and I happened to be completely lucky enough to be invited to a dinner, a uh, Vic Firth artist dinner, and it was um, Joe Testa head of artist relations um and it was myself weckel uh keith carlock jason mcgurr drummer from death cap for cutie and omar hakim and i mean it was just be amazing to be a, a fly on the wall and, and listen to those guys talk about stuff but but w somehow contemporary drummer plus one came up and we were all really showering Dave with props for that. And we all kind of had, not Omar, but but Jason and Keith and I all had, because Omar is, is older, older and, and mm -hmm. you know, was already well established when that came yep. out. But but we were all talking about how influential and how important that, that educational package was to us at the time. And um, I mean, somebody even brought up Rainy Day, you know, like the tune Rainy Day. And, and it, it was fun. It was nice for everybody to kind of all give them props about that at, at, at the dinner. Nice. Nice. So. Yeah, for me, it was more like, you ain't good. You ain't good if you can't play this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and I think we all, too, agreed, like, we had all at some point had some sort of really basic home recording setup and recorded ourselves playing <laughs> along with those tracks and probably have, I'd I probably, know I have a cassette yeah. tape somewhere of me just butchering Garden Wall and, you know, yeah. I mean, it's... Those exist for me, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> well, this this I mean, the other side of this is it, it opened my eyes to drum machines and sequencers, and I went down that rabbit hole. I got a drum machine right away. Like yeah. just the idea if I could program a song and I could play to it. It, it this I was twelve years old, and this yeah. this was a whole new thing. Like sure, Van Halen. Yeah. What? Let's go down this world. So spur of the moment. I mean, <laughs> oh man! It's like the the craziest dentist office music you could ever imagine. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's like the outtake for the Entertainment Tonight theme, <laughs> right? The, the, those guys definitely got their money's worth for the DX7. That they oh bought. my gosh! Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's that's a lot of DX. That's a lot of DX. <laughs> a lot of a lot of Yamaha <laughs> FM sounds. And whatever the slap bass sound is too, I love it. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. So silly, but there's nothing silly about what they're what he is no, playing. Yeah. No, yeah. And this has a solo, a, a, a thing that Weckl loved to do, which was solo over a vamp. Mm -hmm. Certainly not the first guy to do it. But I had a student recently who, um, a really, really great bebop drummer, like a, a excellent drummer, um, and already playing a lot of high-level gigs around New York. But um, one of the things he came into a lesson one day, he said, like, you know, can we talk about soloing over a vamp? I, I feel like every time that happens, I just don't know what to do. And I actually played him some Weckle and some Gat mm. soloing over a vamp and just talk about, like, listen to the way they're phrasing, listen to the space they're leaving. Um, yeah, I guess that was sort of a new thing. Did that happen Well, I mean, I also played him stuff like Max Roach soloing over a walking bass line. Music. Yeah, yeah right, 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 right. Yeah, I'm sure that's where they're That's probably from. where they where they may have gotten yeah. it from. But, um, Good chance, maybe. Yeah. All right, you two need to duke it out over Amnesia. There's no duking out. It's just cool that we both <laughs> yeah. picked the same yeah. tune. Same tune and the same spot, so. That's cool. Well, it's going to be this spot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it. <laughs> so why'd you pick it? And why did you want well, to pick it? Well, I will say this tune, you know, I was an electric band fanatic. And um, I had all their first couple records on cassette. <laughs> and my buddy, my best friend growing up, saxophonist named Josh Dunleavy, he got 
this is the third Electric Band record called Eye of the Beholder. He got it on CD. And at some point, I realized when I was over at his house one day, like, oh, there's like bonus tracks on the CD <laughs> mm. that aren't on the cassette. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, there's, I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And then sure, <clears throat> and I think he also had Light Years and the first Electric Band record. And I was like, oh, my God, there are bonus tracks on all of these. <laughs> so then I had to go get the CDs <laughs> so I could hear all these. Yep. It was like a new album's yeah. worth of music I didn't have. Yeah. And this is a bonus track that wasn't on the cassette near the end of the album that um, gets pretty adventurous, you know. And in some ways, when I, when I think about the cassette release, it kind of makes sense that maybe this was left off. But <clears throat> to me, it kind of foreshadowed, in a way, in my mind, like what was to come next, in a way. It kind of sets up the mm -hmm. next record, the Inside Out record, totally. which is kind of their weirdest record, and it's probably my favorite record. I think I picked something off of that as well. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the feeling I had of this. It was like, wow, man, they're really going for some stuff. you know. And why did you pick this one? I picked it because um, the acoustic band, which is Chick, yeah. John, and Dave playing straight ahead acoustic jazz in a trio was really influential to me and I wanted to pick a tune from that but I ended up going for this just because it's also that rhythm section playing straight ahead and Weckl using you know he's using an 18 inch bass drum he's using some different cymbals darker cymbals and um, just Weckl's approach to playing bebop and playing stuff in the jazz language was really important to me and it was he was one of the first guys like he was the first guy that i ever heard i remember again when jan fung played me got a match he pointed out to me now listen to what he's doing on the hi-hat when he first goes into straight ahead time on the head and he and he's doing like um you know jack dejanette roy haynes influenced hi-hat left foot stuff mm -hmm. um I'd never heard anybody do that. I'm sure I'd heard people do that, but it was the first time it was pointed out to me. Like, mm -hmm. listen to what he's doing. Listen yep. to how he's incorporating the hi hat, yep. in, in, as part of the timekeeping voices. And I was, it just completely blew my mind. Mm. Know, Wack was the first guy that I and really. And also, like the, the sound of the that. production on some of these later tunes, like the bonus yeah. tracks. It, like this tune particularly, it's it sounds a little different. Yeah, for the drum sure. sounds change, but it's like it almost sounds like Bernie Kirsch did some different stuff to it to make it sound a little more. Ambient and I think he, yeah, you know. he just, I think he turned up the room like yeah, simple as but, that. But, but yeah. it's, it was like oh, a different a different look at this stuff, this mm -hmm. band. The stuff. You know? Also, I picked this track because the stuff I was talking to talking about before with Weckl phrasing similar to Buddy Rich setting up figures in a slightly um, you know with a little bit more space. Mm -hmm. um, he does that. It's it's a much faster tune, but he does that on mm. this a bunch. Nice. There's some cool Sweet. setups. Check out that second. That's, this is one minute, 20 seconds into Amnesia. It goes back to the beginning of the album, team. you know. They, they, or, uh, they oh, reprise oh. like the that's eternal hard, child. Yeah. Hard, hard music. It's hard music. It's really hard. It's really hard music. That's like maybe what the third take. <laughs> I mean, that, they I maybe ran it a couple of times just to make sure they got those two D sections, it. and then they did it, and that's Good what they did. Gosh, yeah, yeah it's yeah. something. It really is. 
You know, Weckl was my transition, direct transition to Elvin Jones Me and too. Jack Dijonette. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. some straight ahead stuff. If, Softies Morning Sunrise, I got into Elvin. Um hundred percent. The acoustic band, I got the Keith Jarrett trio right after that. I, I, I was, I was um, Neil Peart, <laughs> to Bill Bruford, to Gad, um, to Weckl, directly to Jack DeJanette, Tony Williams, Elvin Jones, Philly Joe Jones. Jimmy Cobb. I mean, that was exact. That was the lineage. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I heard uh, jazz records cool. from my dad, but I, but the, the instrumental jazz music I was listening to on repeat from myself, not like that I found from myself, was 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 this stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then it went. Then I went back more to, to Tony and Elvin and Jack, and you know, so it's kind of the same. This was a led me into jazz, you know, with more acoustic jazz. Yeah. yeah. It's so complicated. I, part of me, I remember as a kid being so frustrated. I didn't know what the hell they were doing. Mm-hmm. But also just so inspired. Like, yeah. Don't feel that way. <laughs> yeah, I still feel that way, yeah. I can't play this stuff. I can't. It, I can't. I mean, <laughs> it's still, you know. Do you want to, though? That's the question now. Yeah. I wish I could play like that. Jeez. It's amazing. And it's exciting and, you know. Yeah, I mean, what I, a lot of what I do professionally is a, a different type of jazz or a different aesthetic or whatever but there are times where there's I mean I don't know yeah I wish I had half those chops oh, <laughs> like I, I've probably got to play this way more than you guys but yeah but yeah I can't play it like that <laughs> <laughs> you know you got a uh, Mama Chola Woo! I knew Steve you were gonna Kong. pick something from this record this came out in 1990 so shortly after that electric band record um, I saw this band, the one gig I think they did um, at the Modern Drummer Drum Festival in 1989. What band is this? This is Eyewitness. This is, this is Steve Cobb's oh, yeah. band, Eyewitness, that Steve Jordan used to be in. And they made, a, they made a record later those are on. Great. And, uh, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I know this. Yeah, you, were, you, you hit me to this. Whoever plays his butt off on this <laughs> one. I almost used my, my line from the other one. Anyway, <laughs> we- Weckles, like, he's killing on this, man. It's. So ridiculous, you know. So who's in the band? This is Anthony Michael. Jackson, Manolo Petrani, and Steve Kahn on guitar. Sweet. So this is the solo section, right? Yeah, this is the solo at the end of the tune. This is like one of the later Eyewitness. It's the last, like, real Eyewitness album. Right. There was tracks on other albums. Right. Then there were some records that came. There was a record that came out with Dennis, which is a trio record without the percussion. Oh uh, yeah. Where they were playing like <clears throat> standards as well as some of the Eyewitness repertoire. Yeah. There's, a, there's some live footage on YouTube of this band with Weckl with without Manolo as well. Mm. Uh, there it is. Yeah, trio stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. Anyway, anyway, here's this is audio or, or video? Audio. Right? Audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Sweden, I have that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good stuff. But it's not really eyewitness without. No, Manolo. I agree. I yeah. agree. I feel the same way about the Dennis stuff. It's 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 amazing. It's amazing. But I, 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 I want to hear. Yeah, but Dennis Manolo is, is key to that sound of that band. And and Weckl talked about Steve Jordan in the on the earlier records being a big influence on him. I believe. Yeah, well, I went back to and discovered that through this. Yeah, and fell Me in too. love with those. I love yeah. those records. So good. And uh, I heard a podcast mm-hmm. with Steve, Steve Kahn. He called this like one of the greatest drum solos of all time. This particular uh-huh. one, yeah, which I can't disagree with. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs>
mm. it's like a bar of four four and a bar of nine eight. You know, mm, just yeah. playing over that. And and like we should say too, <clears throat> I think I have something coming up later that I picked. It's it's not him blowing, but um, you know, we're picking these. It's hard to pick these little chunks because you know, like the payoff is if, it's if you hear the the song oh, and it leads yeah, to that. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like. You know, I don't want to just let on that it, all that matters is taking drum solos over bass. Listen, listen to the whole track. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's about the, the music yeah. and the way he plays. And, and there's some great ballads on this record, great grooves, different feels, and and he kills it. You know, he, he, it's not just about the the wonderful like virtuosic soloing all the time. You know, so that phrasing is what I heard at Pasek. It was like, what is happening? It's not. It's not obvious. Yeah, but you can understand it in some way. Hmm. That's pretty wild. The next one you picked is uh, Inside Out Kicker. Mm -hmm. Also, so this is like right after the the melody. This is like a period for me. This is when I really started to hear the change kind of happen. Wait, from from what me, is this song? Ninety. 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 And I saw the band for the first time on this tour, <clears throat> and um, this is like first three rack tom. Kinda. And mm. We talked about this yeah, before, yeah. and. and um, to me, this album has a little more classical influence or something. I don't know if Bartok. that makes sense, you know? Yeah. And um, it's hard music, really hard music. And I'm just shocked at, like, what they get into. Like, we're kind of missing the melody, and it, this is, like, the beginning of the, the piano solo. But just the way he plays off of Chick and John, like, hearing the trio play here, you know, it kind of, when I hear it now... <clears throat> it's the same way I get excited when I'm playing with a like a pianist and a bass player and, and it's you're not no one's really overplaying, but just the way that you play off of each other, the little nuances mm -hmm. is what really knocks me out about this and how how loose it is, you know. Cool. So check it out, see what you think. So I have it marked at one oh four in into the track. Does that sound right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, they kind of get more into a backbeat, but like that beginning section, it's That's just nice, it's man. just so free, and you know. There's a great thing that happens at the very end of this tune. I mean, this, it's uh, similar. The, the whole record, there's, they they do this funny <laughs> thing. It almost sounds like they had expected to fade the tune out, and they're just kind of doing some weird stuff yeah. at the end. That's that's really kind of fun. I can't imagine, like, reading this stuff and accessing that I kind of you. playing. It's yep. it's. That's Ridiculous. the hardest thing about reading is to not sound like you're reading. Yeah, mm -hmm. and to you be know? listening. Because, of you know, you're putting... It takes so much mental energy to focus your eyes and follow along and actually but still make be the in rhythms. the moment of the music. Yeah, and make, make right to be choices. Open. Oh. Yeah. And the pressure of this band. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Following, you know, Return yes. to Forever and Three Quartets and yep. Friends and, like, this new these new guys. And, Absolutely. Like, man, like... Yeah. Be, be amazing. Yeah, right. Hey guys. <laughs> right now. <laughs> wow, everyone. Yeah. The way everyone's the listening. The symbols to like accent the phrases with yeah. no bass drum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess Gad did some of that, but not like that. Like, yeah. Just the There again, that color. extension. Yeah. 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 Really cool. Do you think, was those, some of those unison things, do you think it was accidental or was that written? Where he well, it's just like Chick were like locked up. There's some, they're kind of just playing the tune. Like they're, they're yeah, accessing okay. stuff from the tune. Yeah, you know, oh, right. the same yeah. way if we were playing, you know, over a form, right, you're right, going right. to accent certain things that mm, maybe sure. a part of the melody or, yep. you know, but amazing stuff nonetheless. 
So good. I don't know these. I only know the first Electric Band record. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta stop uh, sleeping. All, <laughs> <laughs> but I was all about Master Plan and Heads Up. Check out In, Inside Out is and Inside Out, man. Inside out. It's unbelievable. It, it's 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 unbelievable and that I, it even got made at and all. I, I remember when it came out, it was so it was so different, like not like as commercial as the other records. Mm. And I remember being like just so excited by that, like wow. I should like this. I have to. I don't understand it. Let me keep listening to it and wow. try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And kudos. And then to eventually, VR. you started to feel like, oh, I can. It's making more sense. Yeah, it was cool. like this unfolding that was happening yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Didn't Eric Harlan reference this record? Yeah, in I was an so interview? happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eric Harlan said that like. Man, don't snooze on this shit. Yeah, he said, like, my jazz me. friends were going to give you a hard time about picking this one. He goes, man, these guys are playing on this. Yeah. He's like, John I mean, and Dave are playing. I mean, he's right. <laughs> They're killing on it's this. It's kind of weird looking back why you would all why you would ever think any negative stuff about Chick Corea's projects. Like, why would you yeah, for a second think he's going to do something corny? Well, I, I, think for, I think for certain people, they like certain things, and that's all they like. Mm. And so when that person does something different, yeah. it's like, what's he doing? You yeah, know? yeah. Why? But, why Chick, but, but Chick, I don't think thought like that at all yeah. <laughs> he was just following his muse and doing his thing yeah you know? it's unbelievable how much output oh had, my gosh how it's prolific incredible. he yeah. was and continued to be up up until a month before he died he yeah. was doing you know stuff at home during the pandemic and stuff yeah, yeah. scary some of those instagram posts he was putting up where he was yeah. sight reading stuff just to watch his process that was incredible yeah <laughs> was like, yeah what the hell is going on? genius of the highest level yeah he's he's something man well, we got one more from Paul from you. This is also from the Electric Band from 1991, Little Things That Count. Okay, the reason I picked this is because um, it just just for the groove, just for the, the pocket and the feeling, because um, a friend of mine um, who I play with a lot had said, now this is a guy who I think, he's a guy who's, who studied a lot of jazz and has studied a lot of like soul and funk and R and B, <coughs> and not an electric band fan. Um, and I suspect that the only thing he's ever heard is is probably "Got a Match" and mm -hmm. maybe something mm -hmm. like "Rumble" or you know those kind of tunes. And and he said, "Man, I'll bet you can't find a tune where they're just laying back in the pocket and playing a groove." I was like, "Okay, here you go." <laughs> so this is why this is really why I picked it. It's not Chick's best tune necessarily or anything like that, but I just love the feel. All right, so here we go. the bass <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that was kind of you know in those days i guess that would have been a go-to for a bass player to like oh it's a funky tune i'm gonna slap you yeah know, yeah it, you know and, but that was just a thing you know stylistic yeah, it was the times day. but Ooh. i think that i think the pocket's pretty slamming it's on pretty it. heavy it's good yeah i like it i don't know if i was ever more excited for an album to come out than than this album <laughs> Really? Because I had just come off of Inside Out being like my favorite thing I'd ever heard. So the thought of another electric band record beneath the mask came out. I was like just salivating, waiting for this album did to come out. Did you love it from the start? Yeah, or? I would have loved whatever they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went. I was at band camp for like marching band. I think I was teaching, actually. I just graduated. I was teaching like the drum line or something. And, uh, and uh, somebody brought me the cassette from like down to California University. I listened to it that night with, with Dunleavy, and we were, like, freaking out. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, new electric band. So I spent the next, like, you know. 
Do you think six kids months, do that these days? I don't think so. That's a shame because just the magic of new music was. That's yeah. all very different today. Oh man, it's, it's a shame because that's that's I think something <clears throat> that was so great for us was that anticipating a new record mm. or just discovering one that was new to you and it yeah. was like, yeah, you know. I mean, I bought head, his solo record, Heads Up, not knowing what the hell was going to yeah. be on it. It just had drums on the cover. Yep. I was like, cool, I'll buy that. And then I bought <laughs> Omar Hakim's record, and I was like, whoa, that's not at all what I thought it was. Yeah, like, like, R&B <laughs> album. Yeah, 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 it was like a smooth pop record. <laughs> but that, I think that you know that was part of what what made made it so good is that sometimes you bought something and it was like, I don't know, man. And, and but then maybe it was like, ah. Oh, no, I kind of like that, you know, mm-hmm. or it's like, no, I hate that. But it was like the experience of hearing something new and having, and you just spent $18 exactly. on it. So <laughs> it's like, exactly I'm it. checking this out. Yep. Did you, you know guys ever I mean? return? I, I returned Radiohead, Hail, Hail, was it? Hail, that was a mistake. Hail, yeah, my first listens, like I absolutely hate it, returned it within two hours, yeah. and then went and rebought it. Like, yeah, I've done, that. <laughs> I've, I've done that with albums, like going back to ones I didn't yeah. like. Yeah. yeah, you know. Like, I hate this. So my buddy bought, uh, chili Peppers on my way, whatever it was when it came out, threw it out the window of his car. He hated it so much. Wow. <laughs> you know what but record it I... It was still just experience. Of like, course. <laughs> I remember buying Jocko's Word of Mouth record and being like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> and then like two years later, I heard like a track off of it somewhere. Yeah. I was like, this is beautiful. And I bought it. Now it's, that's one of my favorite albums yeah. of all time. It's a great record. Because I wasn't ready for it. Yeah. You know? you know what I'm getting warm to now is The Grateful Dead. Oh, yeah? Because oh, I got some free records. My buddy works at a, a distributor. He just sent them to me. And interesting. Like, Let me give The Grateful Dead a fair shake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know a lot of guys that are really into them, yep. like, that I play with. I, I've never got. I've never checked it out, really. Yeah, me like, either. But I know a lot of people who are. Yeah. Who are just great that musicians. discovery. I miss it. Anyway, we got two more from you. Mm-hmm. We've got Mike Stern, Between the Lines. Yeah, this is a tune where, like, kind of like what Paul is just saying, like, this is, this is not him blowing at all it's just him kind of playing the tune and feels amazing it's unbelievably simple not simple to make it feel or sound like this but he's not playing anything complicated um it's like mid 90s and uh just love the way he like try making try to make this feel this good right Mm -hmm. good luck yeah Yeah. that's what i'll tell anybody all right here we go Like, could that bass drum sound any better? Yeah. <laughs> Is that Brecker? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, it doesn't say it on the listing. Um, but, yeah, man, that is, that is like, really that feels great. killing, man. Great, man. You yeah. know? And there's some signature things in there. Yeah. yeah. He, and I like that when he does, he, like, like the way he plays on Lifescape on Beneath the Mask. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, Like, yeah. this little stuff with the ride cymbal, like, when it's quiet playing. Yeah. Like, I, it's beautiful how he's, man, he's killing. <laughs> he's <laughs> he feels so long... good. You association know. with Mike Stern. Yeah. He's on Upside Downside, mm-hmm. which is like 85 or 86, mm-hmm. and they still play together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think if I think of Mike Stern, I think of Dave Weckold. Mm-hmm. No I, saw, I saw Weckold with Stern at a club in Philly, like a little club, and and um, like around the time of this, like right before this album came out, and the sound he was getting in that, like there was like speakers all over the, like behind you in the room and it wasn't loud, but you could hear like, you know, if he had like a chain on a cymbal or if he played brushes, you could really hear everything, you know. And That's I remember very just- important to him. Yeah, and it was just the sound they were getting. Mm-hmm. Playing trio, I was like, man, this mm-hmm. is amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Blew me away, like, couldn't believe this sound, how good the, the, the drums were sounding. Sound is everything, right? And mm-hmm. also the same, Day of that concert, I saw him give a clinic at U Arts, 
and uh, we were all waiting in this hallway oh, for him to show up. And he walked past us all, and he went into the room for like 30 minutes and like got the drums kind of like where he could play something on like a kit that was there. And I remember like you could just hear them rustling around there, moving stuff around. And all of a sudden, I just heard him go whack on the snare drum. I was like, woo. <laughs> so I was like, Dave Wiggle, you know. But it, I knew that sound. Yeah, it was yeah. like, bam, there, there it is. is. What year would that have been? Mid nineties. But it's like I remember you hearing the. Uh, Throckmorton plot gig. Oh yeah, and you were talking about the sound of the snare drum. Sound like Dave Weckl. And you were yeah. like, "Man, that sounds like Dave Weckl." And I was like, "Man, <laughs> wow. God, I, I can't escape it." You know? <laughs> but that just means it sounded right. Yeah, it just sounded like the drums were supposed to sound. Uh, and I, when I hear the recordings back of that band, I'm like, "Man, that's a good, you know, just like from an overhead." It's like, "Man, that's, that's, that snare drum sound is mm-hmm. something to it, man." It's amazing how many people do not get a good sound. Even yeah. some like really well known players, mm-hmm. you hear I, them in person and it's harsh. I mm-hmm. think a lot of drummers, it's the last thing they think about. They're so concerned about what they're playing and not what kind of sound do you get when you play anything. You know? Yeah. Oh, man. It's funny, horn players will stand in a corner for hours and play long tones just listening to their sound mm-hmm. and trying to develop it and get certain and that's yeah. the first thing you you relate to with a with a, totally with a person right. speaking to a person, yeah. hearing no someone question. sing, play a note. It's the like sound. That's, that's the sound. Like you said from the from the first thing on uh, step it. step it today, you're like, man, he's like he's playing with sound, and the sound's always been crucial yep. to his presentation. Yep. Yeah. And and it's and it's what sets him apart. Uh, uh, obviously, the playing as well. But sonically, like his sound thing is so strong. Yep. You know, there's and, no and, bigger and bummer the, than hearing someone with a harsh sound. Oh. Like, like, it's like yeah, biting you in the face the whole time. Like what? Yeah. There's there's a lot of there's lot of drummers I've heard who are really great players. Like they play well, but you can tell they don't really think about that so yeah. much. Yeah, and and the the to segue into this, that's kind of why I picked this too. It's like it's the sound. Mm-hmm. The sound he's getting on here is mm-hmm. scary. Mm-hmm. Well, while we listen to the prologue, we have to talk about the sound of his signature six that you brought in here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I Original remember buying issue. a pair of these when they first came out. Um, and these are this is a pair I bought on eBay. This is a brand new, unused pair of Dave Weckl signature model Vic Fur Sticks, the original version. So they, they changed them at some point in the 90s. Uh, maybe in the late 90s. Now, he came up with a second signature stick, which he still uses, which is a completely different kind of stick. But the red ones, they also kind of changed them. They made them bigger at some point. Mm. And um, the earlier ones, just to me, I really like. They have a, a really nice balance. Um, and also this this wood grain red so amazing, finish. Yeah. It's so beautiful. I, I have a funny story about those sticks. Um, real quick, when my... You can keep them. <laughs> you might not get them back. Um, my brother, when he was in the military, he would come home to visit occasionally. And sometimes he would bring stuff home and leave it at home. But he knew if it was anything drum-related that I was going to confiscate it and ruin it, you know? Mm. Whether it be, like, a, a record or, or, or gear, or, right. you know? Like, so he had brought home a bunch of sticks and hid them in my dad's closet. And, of course, me being, like, a young kid, I eventually found, oh, what is that? thing of sticks up there there, and i didn't even know those existed yet and i was like oh my god a pair of sticks with dave weckl's name on it so of course i played them and (laughs) ruined ruined and they were they didn't exist anymore (laughs) (laughs) when i met you this is what you were playing i'm sure that first night at the balcony you were all red drum heads yeah and they they were all sort of shredded (laughs) and sort of you know hickory here you know from the symbols yeah and my brother i'm sure at some point was like where are my sticks i'm like too bad (laughs) they're gone now (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, well, we're going to fade it out with prologue. This is Dave Grusin's uh, West Side Story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you picked a chunk from two minutes and 25 seconds on. This is the first tune. He's just playing his butt off. <laughs> and, again, I'm just, like, picture him. I wonder how much they rehearsed it. You know, just he just he plays the heck out of this, man. His drums sound, like, scary good. This is a large Late ensemble 90s. thing, yeah. too. And, and, like, 97. I mean, having done recording sessions where there's a large ensemble it's really stressful you're it's, responsible for yeah. so many people and it's so easy to do things to that just up. derail I, I remember, the session Absolutely. i remember this came out when i was on tour with, with Maynard's band and we were in london for two weeks playing at ronnie scott's and and um you know all this free time during the day and paul thompson and i would like walk down to all these record stores all the time and the, there was a borders that had this on one of those listening stations mm-hmm. but i didn't buy it 
because like everything was like twice as much over there. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, yeah. We weren't making any money, so I would just go every day and like listen to this track. <laughs> this track. Yep. Over That's and over. Great. I would just sit there for an hour and just yeah, listen to that again. No lie. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah. 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 I, again, it's it's hard to play a tune like that with a band like that and give everybody exactly what they need to play their parts mm-hmm. correctly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Because you get large ensembles like that. It's hard for like all these guys doubling on flute, trying to like you know, uh, yep. yeah. And, and he's giving them exactly what they need to play their parts. Yeah. And he's being himself. Yeah. He's like. He's yeah, that could 100%. only be Dave Weckl. Yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> Beautiful. Thanks, yeah, guys. Man. Yeah, man. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, that's it for this week's episode. I hope you found some new music to check out or some old music that you haven't listened to in a while. Go dig back through. I know I'm on a quest to find some of those electric band records that I never owned back in the day. And some of that early era stuff is really kind of catching my ear. So hope you enjoyed the show. If you don't mind, drop a review on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube, some comments. Um, share it on your Instagram or Facebook. That will help get this show around to more drummers around the world. So until next week, have a good one. Enjoy some more Dave Weckl. See ya.